How do you see the situation right now in Avdivka? Yeah, Ukraine Ukraine's getting wiped out. Uh, they've got thousands of soldiers that are surrounded, many wounded that are being left behind because they can't escape. Uh, the ones who are trying to escape are getting bombed, shelled, strafed, shot. No, it's an ugly situation. This is this is a worse defeat than what uh, Ukraine experienced when they lost Bakhmut a year ago. Th this is another major step that Russia is taking towards both attriting the Ukrainian armed force and then uh, preparing to move to uh, the Dnieper River. There were some rumors about killing Azov battalions. Uh, Solidove, I think, is the name. Uh, it is a city uh, to the west of Donetsk, the city of Donetsk. It was hit with at least two Iskander missiles. Uh, reportedly, there were at least one, two battalions of uh, the Azov battalion, uh, renamed, reconfigured after their defeat in Mariupol two years ago. And uh, they there were about s at least 600 troops, maybe more, maybe uh, 1,200. And they got hit and killed a bunch of them, wounded a bunch of them. And... Uh, you know, the, it, it, again, it's one of the problems with modern warfare in the age of ISR. You know, we in the in the book and movie Lord of the Rings, you had the Eye of Sauron, the all-seeing Eye of Sauron. Well, that's sort of what's going on. You got both on the you know, the Western side and the Russian side. They've got satellites, drones, other uh, aircraft personnel or aircraft capabilities up that can see. The battlefield, they can see troops assembling. They can see where they're located. And with those coordinates, you can then launch. You have long-range uh, missile systems that are capable of hitting those targets, which is exactly what happened. Uh, this is sort of typical of General Sirsky, who took over from Zaluzhny last week. Uh, you know, he didn't get his n nickname Butcher uh, Sirsky for nothing. Uh, he has a you know pretty good track record, a consistent track record of piling in Ukrainian forces into losing causes and getting thousands killed and wounded. Uh, he did it in the Botsova. Uh, he did it in Bakhmut a year ago. And he looks like he's doing it again in Avdiivka. So um, the, the Russians have created what they're calling them cauldrons, bo boilers. Basically, they're encircling Ukrainian troops are in positions where the only way they can get out is try to flee on foot and hope they can break through without getting shot or killed by the Russians. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is really one of those uh, situations in which Ukraine is suffering, suffering a devastating defeat. And they don't have any U.S. resources to fall back on. They don't have any manpower waiting in the wings that could be delivered uh, to the front lines to, you know, try to hold back the Russian horde. Uh, you know, I think I think we're reaching, we're really uh, reaching a potential end game here, because this is not just hurting. It's not just in this one spot that Ukraine is getting beat. Uh, it had to withdraw forces from other areas, and the Russians have, they have the numbers of person of troops that they can exploit those openings, and Ukraine does not have. The air power to with to to fight back, and it has limited missile supply, and Russia continues to aggressively target the missile rocket sites as well as airfields. Zaluzhny was not present in the Rada of Ukraine at the hearing of the draft law on mobilization. It seems that this division within the Ukrainian military is so serious. And you have Zaluzhny supporters. You have uh, some Sirsky supporters. It's alleged that the uh, Zaluzhny folks are more numerous. Zaluzhny had closer ties with these neo-Nazi groups. And here, Sersky is putting them into battle where they're being chewed up and destroyed. Now, some in Ukrainian circles, this is not Western circles, it's Ukrainian circles, are circulating the word that uh, Sersky, who was born in Russia, who has a brother in Russia, whose parents live in Russia, who's reported in conversations with his parents saying he hates Ukrainians, is being accused by some of deliberately sacrificing the Azov and the Kraken folks because of their neo-Nazi beliefs in order to wipe them out 
so that they can't pose a threat down the road when uh, Russia finishes demilitarizing Ukraine. Interesting, interesting theory. Um, the Russians aren't denying it, but why would they? You know, you get, get a story that good going on and people believe in it, you know, just keep feeding it. So uh, that's one, you know, one possibility. But the, the, the reality is this. Ukraine does not have trained manpower. If you're going to recruit people, and right now it's forcible recruitment. I mean, they're basically kidnapping people off the streets. You still have to put them through training. And that training, we're talking, you know, you know minimum of three months, if you're going to do it right. Now, if all, if all you're going to do is go through the motions, you know, well, oh, yeah, we give you a uniform, we give you a rifle, you're, you got your weapon, you're trained, go. Well, they're not going to be competent on the battlefield. Uh, they're not going to know anything about maneuver warfare, about how to coordinate movements with other units, about how to integrate operations with air power, with drones. I mean, you know, a lot of this is pretty complex stuff if you're going to do it right. That takes a little while to learn it. They don't have that time. But Ukraine does not have that time. Because right now... There's no process in place for them to get any aid from the United States, even the approval, until 1st of March. Um, so that's, you know, two weeks away. And uh, I think in that ensuing, in the next two weeks, you're going to see the Russians make even greater gains on the ground. Uh, so towns like Chazafyar and others uh, could uh, fall. And, and, you know, Ukraine's going to be in full-fledged retreat. I think we're that close to that happening because, you know, they've been attrited. The Ukrainians don't have secure, capable, well-supplied forces that are in a position to fight back. They just don't. Bloomberg reported that Russia has no shortage of military and supplies. The question is this, does the Biden administration understand what's going on right now in Ukraine? Why they're so insistent on sending more aids, more weapons, more funds to Ukraine, if that's the case? I, th I think the real question that needs to be asked and hasn't really been answered to my satisfaction is why what motivated the, the West in 2014? What was really the triggering event that led the West to back the coup? What was the, what was the providence of that? Why then? Because you look at there was not like Russia had done something. It'd be one thing if Russia had already gone into Syria to counter U.S. and British efforts to depose Assad. He didn't, Putin didn't do that until after the Maidan. Uh, the Russian foreign policy became much more aggressive in countering what the West was doing. Um, so it, it gets back to what were the financial interests? We, we do know that the Clinton Foundation was, of all countries in the world, received more money from Ukrainians who were oligarchs. So it didn't come officially from the government, but it did come from all these wealthy Ukrainians who pumped all this money into the Clinton Foundation. Well, you do that, you're expecting something in return. The Clintons, you know, they may have claimed it was a charitable organization, but it was a it was a pay to play, baby. You know, you paid them and you got the play, you got the access. Um, we don't know the full scope of what the uh, Department of Defense was doing, as well as we've now got additional evidence of pharmaceutical companies that were going in to areas like Mariupol and using human beings as guinea pigs. Uh, in medical trials that normally wouldn't be allowed. It was as if uh, Joseph Mengele, the, the infamous Nazi doctor at Auschwitz, had been resurrected and turned loose. So uh, this uh, so-called unwavering commitment of the United States to Ukraine, in part as an excuse to keep funding the defense industry in the United States. Pump, you pump more money into that defense industry, it, it, and it keeps it creates jobs, and they in turn contribute money back to the members of Congress that uh, voted to appropriate them money. So you, you know it's 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 a crooked situation, a crooked system. If Russia was trapped in Ukraine, that would help to overthrow Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Well, no, the, the the time for overthrowing Assad has come and gone. 
but they they could have they could have I think they may have counted on the hope that Ukraine would have weakened Russia to the extent that Russia could no longer continue to operate in Syria. But it's, it's just the opposite. You know, Russia's acquired combat experience in Syria that they're then translating to the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, again, you come back and ask yourself, why did the West suddenly decide that Bashar al-Assad needed to be overthrown? Uh, he wasn't. He was not murdering his people. He wasn't rounding them up, putting them in concentration camps. He was defending against. He is fighting back against the very Islamic extremists, ISIS, that the United States claimed it opposed. Uh, Bashar al-Assad protected Christians, the the Orthodox Christians. He didn't persecute them. And yet. Uh, I think the West, again, pr primarily for economic reasons, to get control of oil, to get control of resources that Syria had within its borders. Um, you know, the West, the West is just uh, out of control. United States, United Kingdom. Um, if they were, if they were a human, if those two, if these two countries were human beings, they would be the equivalent of a drug addict or alcoholic needing an intervention. Because they're out of control. They're they're just degenerate junkies. Financial Times reported that NATO is afraid of the Russian military industrial complex. Is there any sort of agenda behind this type of reporting? Because Putin just said they're not interested in attacking NATO. There's always an agenda. The problem is the West can't get its story straight. Now, which is it? The Russian military is weak. They're making their rockets. They're having to use... Uh, computer chips from washing machines and refrigerators in order to fire rockets. Oh my God, their their military is incompetent. They're poorly led. They got it's all filled with conscripts. They've been forced. They got guns to their heads, or they don't really want to fight. Then they're no good at fighting anyway. Oh my God, they're terrible. Or Jesus God, the Russians are coming. They're greater than. The, the Star Wars force, they can overwhelm all of Europe. Okay, get your story straight, guys. Which is it? I mean, they're the giant that's 10 feet tall or they're mini-me uh, from the Mike Myers movies, you know, uh, a dwarf, tiny dwarf with uh, no capabilities. Please just give me one storyline, stick with it, okay? But no, the West is schizophrenic. Uh, they're like the god of Jan, you know, Janus, the god, two faced, looking forward and backwards, and you know, they don't know which Russia is up. Uh, so uh, it's the chaos is on the western side. Beat, you know, beats the hell of me out what their story is today. You know, uh, is it that Russia is now they got this massive military complex that can't be stopped? Well, if that's the case, what you know, the West is without hope. But it's it's not Vladimir Putin that has conducted military invasions of Syria, of Iraq, of Afghanistan, of Libya, of Somalia, uh, Ethiopia. Let's, I mean, just go down the list. Uh, over if you go down the list over since 1989, you know the Russia military incursion outside of its country where it didn't ask permission because it was attacked by Georgia, was in 2008, the war with Georgia in August 2008. Other than that, Russia stayed at home. Russia has not been engaged with extracurricular military activities outside of its national borders. United States sure as hell has been. So has Great Britain. Hell, you know, ask the people of Serbia, former Yugoslavia. So... This this refusal to look at the truth about who the real imperial powers are that are causing mayhem that are is Russia bombing Yemen? No. Is Russia launching cruise missile attacks in Baghdad? No. Is Russia killing settlers and civilians and shepherds in Syria? No. It's the United States. You know, it's my country, but you know. We can't pretend that it's something else. That it is what it is. So, uh, you know, I I fully understand why Russia is doing what Russia is doing. 
because they've been backed into a corner. They had no choice. German journalists, Jihad Julian and or Julian Robke. Yeah, Ju Julian Robke, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Julian Robke, he tweeted that no European army gave only 10% of its military resources to Ukraine to defeat the Russian invasion army. He's attacking Europeans that they don't have to criticize the United States because they did nothing for Ukraine. Yeah, so he he's basically saying that they need to do more for Ukraine? Exactly. All right, great. Have at it, guys. No, they're, they're weak. Germany Germany has basically in the process of deindustrializing itself, and it's led by the Green Party, which is exactly what it wants. They want to de deindustrialize the number one industrial country in Europe. Great. Commit suicide. I don't care. You know, go ahead. Have at it. Ditto for France, ditto for Germany, uh, I mean England. You know, they can you know, they can all get in a boat and set the boat on fire for all I care because what they've been is a destructive. Uh, this war in Ukraine didn't have to happen. And it's happening because not just the United States, but Europe were collaborators with the United States and rebuffing and trying. They, they hate Russia. One of the reasons they hate Russia is because of its conservative religious values. They don't embrace the homosexual agenda. And some people go up and say, well, you know, you're anti-gay. I'm not anti-gay. But, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, what, what consenting adults do in the privacy of their own room is their business. But then to make it a matter of national policy that, you know, everybody must bow the knee to the uh, gay agenda, the LGBTQ agenda. Sorry. You know, Russia's not playing that. They say, no, no, no. We believe in heterosexual marriage. We believe that families are comprised of a man and a woman. We, we believe that this is ordained of God. And for them having the audacity to believe that, the West hates them. They hate them because they see that as backwards, as primitive. And so I, you know, I make the case that in some respects, Russia is actually the, probably the, the trying to save the West from itself. Whether or not it can accomplish that remains to be seen. German finance minister Christian Linder at the Munich Security Conference, he said that maintaining Berlin's defense spending at 2% of their GDP, it's already a difficult task. They signed a security guarantee with Ukraine. How you can put all of this together? Because it doesn't seem that Germany is in a good shape. And you see they're getting more aggressive. Well, they're, they're, they're getting verbally more aggressive. But, you know, they remind me of the of this grossly obese man sitting in a recliner, uh, lecturing other people about how they need to get up and exercise, you know, when he can't even get his own fat ass out of the chair. That's Germany. It, you know, what what military does it have? Its, it's tanks have already been proven useless on the battlefield. They've gotten crushed. So, and, and, the real thing is this industrial power, its ability to replace what it lost is, is going down the tubes. Uh, I, I, you know, I've got complete disdain now for Europe. They really are. It's a whole despicable collection and in terms of the government. People are, you know, people can be nice and wonderful, but the governments are just bereft of any kind of moral authority. They can sign any agreement. They, they can sign an agreement that they're going to protect a, a, an invasion of Mars. What are they going to do about it? I mean, seriously, the, the German Navy, you, you know, they got, they got a few, a few boats, a few ships, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a nothing burger with respect to, you know, fending off China as if China wants to invade Taiwan. Again, look at things from China's perspective. Which countries are openly talking about going to war, fighting a war with China? United States, now Europe. China's not out saying, oh boy, we're, we're, we're ramping up to go to war with the West. They're not the ones saying, hey, we're going to be at war with the United States in three or four years. That's the West saying that. And it's 
the West is supplying weapons to Taiwan. Better seen as potential offensive weapons to be used against China. If if China was pumping that kind of weaponry into Cuba, the United States would not stand for it for a minute. So, like I said, we're the United States has gotten into the position of being this one-way street. It's our way or the highway. You can't no. There's no no reciprocity involved at all. We can we can do what we want. We can kill what we want. We can blow up what we want. We can take what we want because we're us. And you just bend over and take it. The head of Ukrainian intelligence is hoping to have F-16 in Ukraine. How do you see the possibility of sending F-16s to Ukraine? And what would be the outcome of this for Ukrainians? It's, well, they're going to lose the they're going to lose the F-16s. As soon as they get airborne, they're going to be dead within 24 to 48 hours. All right, so let them come. Uh, I'm not even sure Ukraine is in a position to actually maintain them once they get airborne. Come back and land. We've got to keep the runways immaculately. I mean, these are, again, these are like um, these high-end sports cars, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, you know, you can't, you don't drive them around town to go pick up the groceries. I mean, these are require special care and, 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 and you have to coddle them. Uh, it's, it's, it's just one more waste of money by the West. And because the, the F-16s are no match for the, air, the, con, the counterpart aircraft that the Russians are flying. In fact, they can, the Russian aircraft can see the F-16s before the F-16s can see the Russian aircraft. And the Russians have the air-to-air -air missiles to destroy those uh, F-16s. They're not going to last long. And, you know, if they spent the last year training a pilot, well, okay, there is a waste of money. He's going to be gone. They're not going to last long. Uh, this is uh, this is political theater, nothing more, in my view. Navalny has died in Russia, and the media in the West is going crazy of making stories about how he was killed. And just putting aside the story of Navalny, we haven't seen such a thing for Gonzalo Lira. When yeah, I was, was just going to say the exact Ukraine. same thing. I mean... Excuse my language, but fuck them. I mean, really, the, the the media, the Biden administration didn't say a damn thing about the murder of Gonzalo Lira by the Ukrainians. And yet they're going crazy over this Navalny character who's a nobody. I mean, he, he has been endlessly promoted by Western intelligence through propaganda, uh, you know, it, putting out stories, presenting him as this great opposition leader. You know, he could maybe attract a crowd of 12,000 people. Okay. That doesn't even fill a football stadium. What has he written that has made him such a voice for the dispossessed of Russia? Nothing. Uh, you know, opposition political candidate. Well, I don't want to hear a word from the West about Russian oppression of opposition political candidates when the United States is busy working its ass off to try to put Donald Trump in jail. When Pakistan has jailed uh, its former prime minister, again, on trumped up charges. When the United States continues to imprison protesters, people who exercise their constitutional right to protest and under the, the bogus charge that they trespassed on the U.S. Uh, Capitol, which is supposedly the people's house, belongs to the people, but not the right kind of people. Yeah, you know, the hypocrisy on this stinks. And then, you know, Gonzalo Lira was one that could have, he, he could have been well served by an intervention. You know, nobody intervened on his behalf. And frankly, you know, Navalny was seen as just a useful, a useful tool for Western propaganda to portray Trump. Uh, I mean, uh, Vladimir Putin as a monster. So, you know, he's dead. Well, let the Russians worry about it. It's not a U.S. problem. The U.S. should worry about its own citizens. They didn't worry about Gonzalo Lira, and similarly, the Brits. 
Who's speaking now for Julian Assange? Who's speaking now for Julian Assange? If we want to talk political prisoners, let's talk Julian Assange. Shifting the gear to the conflict in Gaza. How do you see their plan in Rafa? What they're going to do in Rafa, in your opinion? I, I don't think, uh, I think they're going to try to exterminate the Palestinians. They're going to push them out. You know, they kept telling them to flee south, flee south. And then every place that the Palestinians arrived, the Israelis started bombing them. They want to shove them into, into Egypt. And once they get them across the border, it's say, hey, they're in Egypt, not our problem anymore, and they're not coming back. Um, it looks low, like Israel is going to uh, launch an invasion into Lebanon. And I say, great. I can't wait for it because Israel is going to get destroyed, going to get beat. And that's the only thing that's going to bring it to its senses when it's suffering a thousand casualties amongst its troops, not a few hundred. Uh, when it's going to look at 10 of 1,000 wounded in combat, when it gets some significant casualties, and when the civilian centers in Israel are hit finally with long-range missiles that up to this point Hezbollah has not used. I, I mean, I can't, the insanity of this, the, the news reports are that the majority of Israelis support invading Lebanon. All right. Uh, you know, there are two ways to learn. There's the easy way and the hard way. Israel's going to learn the hard way. You try to warn them. You try to tell them that they can't do this. But they don't want to listen. They are so caught up with their bloodlust. They are murdering thugs. There's no other way to view the Israelis. They're killing women, children, ambulance drivers, reporters, uh, doctors. The treatment... the they, they have no regard for human life. And uh, if, there, if there is a God that holds people accountable for such actions, the judgment on Israel is going to be terrible because what they are doing violates. You know, they, the state of Israel was created out of the ashes of the Holocaust. And you would think that people that came out of that experience would have at least some shred of empathy towards other dispossessed people. But no, no, no. Uh, you know, the, the Holocaust in Israel has just been used as a decoration. They, they trot it out as an excuse when they need it. Because the reality was, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, Holocaust survivors in Israel were shunned. They weren't welcomed. They were, they were almost derided as having been cowards, as having allowed this to happen to themselves. You know, the native Israelis uh, despised them. And, and now they've, uh, they, they've, they've sunk to these levels of brutality where they are just uh, wantonly killing Palestinian civilians. I, I mean, it, it infuriates me. Uh, I say that as someone who once considered myself a supporter of Israel. As they say, never again. Amen to that, never again. They sent all of these people to the southern part of Gaza. Right now, they're trying to drag them to the northern part of Gaza. What's yeah. the strategy there? Well, why they're doing this? They're trying to kill as many as they can. They're starving them. They're not allowing food in. But there is they, no infrastructure in the northern part of Gaza. Right, right. Put people up there so they can die. That's it. If they're dead, Israel doesn't have to worry about them anymore. Uh, you know, what's sad is, uh, apart from the Yemenis, so far no other state, no other leader in the Middle East has stood up to fight on behalf of the Palestinians. They're sitting around wringing their hands saying, oh boy, that's terrible, but what can we do? Yeah, you can start by shutting off oil to Israel. You know, that's a start. South Africa is the other country trying to do something uh, in terms of uh, its legal actions against Israel. But apart from South Africa and Yemen, the, the rest, Jordan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Egypt, useless. How about Sisi right now? How do you see the policy of Egypt? Are we going to have some sort of conflict? You mean Sisi, the president of Mexico, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, 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 hold on. <laughs> oh, you mean Sisi, the president of Egypt? Yeah, but Biden couldn't get that one right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, again, Sisi's 
I've heard the you know expression called weak as rooster soup. You know, you don't not cooking with roosters is not very good chicken meat. And uh, you know that the, the Egyptian people care, but they haven't risen up in a point now to try to force the matter with uh, Sisi. And Sisi is allowing himself to be routinely disrespected by the Israelis. I, you know, this this could end tomorrow if the United States simply told Israel, "This is this stops. You're going to stop the killing now." You're going to open the Rafa crossing and allow those humanitarian aid trucks in. It's happening now. Or you're not getting another dime, not another bomb, not another bullet from us. But they're not doing that. And he's not going to do it because Biden is bought and, bought and paid for by the APAC crowd. When you look at the situation right now, by these attacks of Israelis on Gaza, it seems to me that they're getting more powerful. Hamas is not getting weaker, is getting yeah. stronger. Well, again, come back to what defines someone as, quote, Hamas, that they've pledged allegiance to the declaration that Hamas issued a few years back, uh, either its initial or the former. Uh, or is it any Palestinian, be they Muslim or Christian, because there are Christian Palestinians, who say we are Palestinians and we have the right to exist in our country without fear of being invaded by an, an occupation army like the Israelis, that we have the right to set up an airport so we can fly in and out at will. We have a right to move in and out of our ports. And th does that make you Hamas? Because you believe that you as a Palestinian have a right to be free and to own land without having to ask the Israelis for permission to do anything? Well, then, the, 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 so that's the reality. Israel doesn't want to destroy Hamas. It wants to destroy the Palestinians. Any Palestinian who dares stand for uh, wanting to have um, a, a state, its own nation, is an enemy. It's that simple. Then the West needs to wake up to that fact. I don't know if you saw this tweet from the White House it said Happy Valentine's Day to Speaker Johnson. He's just putting the blame on Johnson because of the border. So Congress, the House of Representatives, has gone on a two-week uh, recess. So they'll be back on the 1st of March. Uh, just in time for the start of March Madness, you know, the college basketball season. Uh, the... What, the, what these members of Congress are going to hear when they return home is their constituents are furious, angry about this flood of people, illegal migrants coming across the border, that it's, it's something that they want taken care of and taken care of now. They don't care about Ukraine. Frankly, they don't really care about Israel either. They care about our own border here in the United States and about what's happening here. They care about the crime that is increasing. They care about the lack of safety and being able to walk public streets. So um, the the notion that uh, Johnson's going to relent on this, I don't think is, is practical. Because you're even getting Democrats now that are saying, oh, wait a second. We got to do something about this migration crisis. You got the the mayor of Washington, the mayor of New York, the mayor of Chicago. They're all crying about it, and oh, stop sending all these refugees! Oh, it's terrible. Okay, yeah, it is. So, um, this uh, the, there's a bullet of uh, political chaos and stalemate, and you know Biden. Is, is busy trying to repair his reputation after the debacle of last Thursday, you know, when he uh, nominated President Sisi to be president of Mexico. You know, yeah, the Sisi's on the border of Gaza and you look in Mexico. And he's like, well, get a map out, Joe. They're, you know, a few thousand miles apart, They're not close. When you look at the situation of Joe Biden, do you think that he can make it? I don't think he'll make it. How he goes, you know, he can wake up dead tomorrow. He, he is getting increasingly frail 
it's like watching somebody being erased with an eraser. You know, each day the the skin is thinner, the looks are more gaunt. He's, you know, he, he doesn't have this. They pump him up with drugs. You know, he came out and did a press conference this afternoon. Uh, he's done for the rest of the day. Uh, you know, then then he'll be tucked into bed and fed some ice cream maybe. But uh, you know, he's he's a disaster. Harry, you wrote a piece on your website about President Trump being a victim of espionage. Can you elaborate on that? And what do you mean by this? So in the summer of 2015, John Brennan, then head of the CIA, uh, in, in consultation and coordination with Hillary Clinton's staff, uh, through John Podesta most likely, uh, began using intelligence community assets with some other folks inside the building to collect information on all the presidential candidates that were running against Hillary Clinton. On the Republican side, it included, in addition to Donald Trump, it included Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz. Because, you know, in, in July and August of 2015, it wasn't clear who was going to be the nominee. In fact, I think even Jeb Bush was still uh, up and running. Uh, they also collected intelligence on um, Bernie Sanders, the Democrat. As time progressed, and there is a, uh, in one of the WikiLeaks leaks, there is a, an email between John Podesta and uh, a Democratic operative by the name of Budowski. And Mr. Badowski and Podesta were commenting on the fact that they needed to hang the Trump uh, bromance with uh, Putin around Trump's neck to make that they were going. Basically, they were talking about using the blame, let's call Trump a Russian asset as a key part of the strategy of their campaign. Now, notice that um, by uh, they had already in August of 2015 the, had identified George Papadopoulos as somebody who might be potentially involved with the Trump campaign. So they kept an eye on him. How did they identify it? The, the British uh, GCHQ intercepted a phone conversation that, from London with uh, Corey Lewandowski, Trump's campaign advisor at the time, campaign manager. And so that's how they identified him. And then they put together an intel op where they said, okay, okay. and it consisted of uh, giving him a job. He was given a job as a, a vice president in this organization that had direct ties to MI6. Then he was introduced to Joseph Massoud, Massoud, who was, a, you know, longstanding ties with both British and American intelligence. And then they concocted this story that they they ran certain assets at him. Uh, one Masood brought what he claimed was the niece of Vladimir Putin. Well, Putin didn't have a niece, so you know that was that was bullshit. Uh, but they created this story, and then they used an Australian diplomat again with ties to the intelligence community, who reported to the FBI. You know, a month or two after a conversation with George Papadopoulos. Oh, this Trump advisor was trying, you know, talking about how they're going to be working with the Russians. That was the pretext to open up uh, Operation Crossfire Hurricane. You know, at the same time, 1st of May, you had the story, the CrowdStrike. This is according to this Ukrainian founder, Alperovich, uh, speaking after the fact in mid-June that, well, the Russians had hacked the DNC. And this was part of an effort to help Donald Trump. Oh, really? So here's the other aspect of the story that's unleashed. They claim that on 1st of March, 1st of May of 2016, oh my God, the DNC discovered the Russians are inside of us. You know, which sounds like a bad porn film, but that's a whole nother uh, story. Um, and, and so they call in CrowdStrike CrowdStrike to the rescue. What does CrowdStrike do? Do they immediately shut down the servers? No, no, let them run. We want to watch the Russians. That's like you're, you know, you're you're at home and the burglars are breaking in. 
and you call the police and said, hey, would you, would you come watch the burglars while they ransacked my house? So they knew this from the 1st of May. They didn't do a damn thing to shut down that Russian penetration. Then on May 26, the emails from the DNC were leaked, sold, in my view, uh, by Seth Rich to join Assange or WikiLeaks operation. Uh, and how do we know that? Well, that, that's the last date of those emails when they came out. So 14 days later, two weeks later, CrowdStrike jumps in. We've got to shut down the servers. We've been invaded by the Russians. And then they create this bogus story about Guccifer 2.0. Oh, yeah, Guccifer 2.0. And what they used, they used tools out of the CIA, what was called Vault 7, that they were cyber tools to make it look like it was the Russians. So they created this entire fictitious character, built this fictitious narrative, again, to convince people that Trump, that Trump was the one who had, uh, was consorting with the Russians. But in fact, it was Hillary. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 then Crossfire Hurricane starts. And they, they, they started with this dossier that comes from uh, Christopher Steele, another former British intelligence officer. Uh, the, the key people at this Halakut uh, Foundation in, in England, they were major donors to the Clinton Foundation and Dear Love, the former head of MI6. So you got intel prints all over the place. Uh, and they're targeting, they're targeting Mike Flynn. Uh, uh, they targeted, targeted Carter Page. Uh, they tried to entrap Roger Stone. I mean, this was a comprehensive effort. They were collecting information on all of Trump's key personnel, all for the purpose of trying to destroy him. And then you had the FBI go in and lie to a federal, to a, the FISA court about, oh yeah, we think we think there's, there's some real evidence that the, uh, the Russians are using Donald Trump. And it was a lie. And then you had the intelligence community, you know, put out an assessment in January. Oh yeah. Russia tried to influence our election, except what happened was the, the guys from NSA had objected. They didn't really buy into it. And now we got reporting this week from Mac Taibbi, Michael Schellenberg, and Alex Gutentag, uh, to pointing out that it was all it was all fictitious. It was fabricated. So long answer to your question. This was a comprehensive effort between the United States intelligence community and British intelligence, and Australian intelligence, and some other intelligence organizations in Europe. Why would they cooperate? They were scared to death that Trump was going to shut down their NATO scam. They had to keep that going. Boy, it's a good jobs program. I got lots of money off the salaries of that. And it was, you know, a complete abuse of the intelligence system. When you look at the presidents of the United States, who's the most responsible president for this mess that we are witnessing right now? Barack Obama. Who did he put in charge? Who did Barack Obama put in charge of Ukraine? Joe Biden. Who signed off on the intelligence finding to launch a coup in Ukraine? Obama. Who tried to overthrow the government of Bashar al-Assad? Obama. Who was funneling weapons from Libya to Islamic radicals? In Syria, Obama, with Hillary Clinton's help. Yeah, it's Obama. Hands down. It's, you know, Biden is just a mindless fool finishing the Biden agenda. Plus, he's got his, he's got his hooks into it because there's money to be made there. You know, he got his boy Hunter was kicking back 10% to the big guy off of uh, his millions that he was making it's by sitting on a board in Burisma. Do you think that the Biden administration right now is getting advices from Obama? Sure. How, how, how important is his role in the Biden administration? B Biden himself is not listening to Obama. Biden is trying to ignore Obama. I think Jill ignores him. But uh, I think some other folks uh, will listen to Obama. Uh, and and you know see him as a you know someone to rely on, you know you know you've got 
you've got a lot of Clinton loyalists there too. And so I'm not, you know, not quite sure, you know, the Clintons and the Obamas don't necessarily like each other. You know, they're not close by any stretch, but I could certainly see them, you know, working together to try to figure out how to, how to get out of this mess with Joe Biden. Because Biden is going to be the death of the Democrats in November. And there are efforts to, you know, demonize Trump. And so far, it seems to just be building support for Donald Trump, not weakening him. Russia going after supersonic, hypersonic missiles. What was the necessity for Russia to doing this, in your opinion? It starts in June of 2002. Uh, George W. Bush abrogates, walks away from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, ABM. When the United States said, oh, we're no longer going to buy, uh, abide by the ABM treaty. That treaty existed to prevent both the United States and Russia from developing air defense systems capable of defeating ballistic missiles. Russia said, well, no, no, let's not do that. And Bush basically said, ah, screw you. You know, go eat borscht. Russia says, okay. Russia went to work immediately. So they're, they're, they had their S-300 system. Next to come online was S-400, and then followed by S-500, and now the S-550. Uh, my understanding is even the S-400 is capable of shooting down intercontinental ballistic missiles, including sea-launched, land-launched, uh, land -launched, and air-launched. This... Uh, uh, and at the same time that they developed that, the United States did not develop an air defense system capable of defeating a ballistic missile, particularly a hypersonic ballistic missile. So Russia focused on developing defensive technology as well as offensive technology, because in 2018, I believe it was Donald Trump. I mean, I know it was Donald Trump. I think the date was... Uh, 2018, where he walked away from the uh, INF, the Intermediate Nuclear uh, Treaty. And by walking away from the INF, uh, Russia looked around and said, well, you know, if you're not going to abide by that treaty, there's no way we're going to implement the START too. So all, at that point, all arms control negotiations were dead. And Russia then developed uh, hypersonic missiles, you know, the Iskander is one example, that the United States can't match. The United States cannot produce a viable hypersonic missile yet. They've been trying desperately. I know that they thought they'd have one out in November of last year, and it still hasn't worked. So, and, and Russia is, is speeding up its uh, research on that. Russia also has satellite killer satellites, flying around. Their satellites can actually go next to a satellite and take it out without harming the Russian satellites. They've got actually maneuverable satellites up there now. So the, this, the United States has lived in this insulated bubble where we believe that we were, you know, light years ahead of Russia. And it's just the opposite. We're light years behind. Russia's light years ahead. And that's why Russia is now in a very, very strong position to, to dictate terms going forward If uh, in the event that there is a conflict. Because let's, I, and I'm not advocating this, I'm not hoping for this, I think it would be a, a horrific, but if things escalated to a nuclear strike, Russia could destroy the United States and any effort by the United States to destroy Russia would fail. We might hit one or two places and cause some significant damage in some isolated areas. But Russia's overall ability to defeat our ballistic missile system is significant. And our planners haven't taken that into account. So it's uh, the, the advantage is to Russia, not the United States. Larry, do you see the same manner for China right now, because it seems to me the same scenario is going to be true for the case of China. It seems they're pushing China to focus on their military. Wait, Al, so just ask the simple question. How many countries has China invaded? 
The last one on record was Vietnam 1979. I keep bringing this up, but I'm going to keep bringing it up over and over and over because the Western lie, the Western propaganda is that uh, China is some revanchist state. You know, they want to go out and recover all their lost territory. Like, what's that? Um, that they are hell-bent on invading other countries and flexing their military muscle. Yet again, and we talked about this earlier, the only country in the world that's uh, actively talking about going to war with the other is the United States, United States military officials, senior military officials, the leader, the head of Indo-PACOM, the U.S. military command in the Pacific, specifically said we'll be at war with China in, in two years, war one year now in 2025. So, you know, from the Chinese standpoint, they, they've they been trying to deflect and defuse this situation. But the United States keeps harping on this myth of that China is this irresistible imperial power hell-bent on dominating the world. No, it's just the United States is upset that it no longer gets to tell the rest of the world what to do. The rest of the world's pushing back. So no, 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 stop. You know, you're not my father anymore. You don't, you don't get to tell me what to do. I'm going to make my own decisions what to do. How do you see the relationship between the Netanyahu administration and the Biden administration? Because they don't it's... like each other. No, they don't like each other at all. But they need each other. That, that's, you know, you know, Biden can say whatever he wants about, oh, yeah, I'm upset with uh, Netanyahu. Okay, show it. Oh, no, no, I can't afford, you know, I can't afford to do it because the, the Jewish money backing him up here in the States is pro Biden, that's pro Netanyahu, uh, will will destroy it. And he doesn't want to, you know, run that risk. Similar with Netanyahu, you know, Net, Netanyahu is actually in a stronger position. You know, he's knows that uh, uh, he's got, He's got a hold on uh, Joe Biden's private parts and is squeezing them, and that you know, Biden can't do much to you know whimper and holler a little bit. But you know, basically, he's he's got to continue to cave to what Netanyahu wants. And this, you know, the people have tried to warn the Israelis about: don't fight, don't attack Lebanon, don't attack Hezbollah, don't do it. It's gonna be bad. Don't do it. And they're so arrogant. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Okay. Find out the hard way, guys. Find out the hard way. When you look at the Red Sea, this fight against Houthis, it's not going the way they want it to be. And they're thinking of Hezbollah, which is much stronger than Houthis. Yeah. No, I mean, Hezbollah is an actual army. You know, Hamas is a ragtag group of guys with some paramilitary training. That they are more of a guerrilla force. Not Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a full-formed army. They're a military organization, chain of command, active active training. They got bases. They're skilled in weaponry, tactics. You know, Israel Israel and really the last time Israel fought them in 2006, Israel lost, or at least pulled out without finishing the job. Because they were losing. They're going to lose more this time, I guarantee it. They'll lose an enormous amount.